first legal practice conversation series of the autumn term. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, some, many of you will be familiar with the format of a legal practice conversation. Uh, it's great to see so many old students here, alumni. Uh, but for those of you who aren't, let me just remind you what these events are about, what the aim of these events for. Uh, the aim of these legal practice conversation events is to see what happens when academics talk to legal practitioners. So see what happens when academic lawyers um, have a chance to talk to people who really know what happens in practice, who experience on a day to day basis in the courts. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that our guest this evening is Mr. Justice Mead. So welcome, Mr. Justice Mead, Sir Richard. It's great Hello. to have you with us. Um, I will introduce you to everybody. Um, Mr. Justice Mead is he's a High Court judge and judge in charge of the Patents Court. So those of you who are interested in IP, I'm sure will be very familiar with cases that he's uh, both held written judgments in and rep being represented people. It's called to the bar in 1991, practiced IP law at eight New Square, New Square Chambers and has appeared before the European Court of Justice and the European Patent Office. And was appointed QC in 2010 and appointed Deputy High Court Judge in 2011. And I'm really delighted that you can join us this evening, Richard. That's wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to make a start and ask you straight away, perhaps you could tell us how and why you decided you would have a career in law. How did you get, what made you think about law? Yeah, very good, very good question. Um, those of you on the call today won't probably know that I was at school with uh, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to answer that question, I have to throw my mind back to the early 1980s. Uh, when we were both at school. Um, I'm 57 now, so that's when I was 16 or 17. And um, the world was a very different place um, then. There was a lot less uh, pressure going to university uh, because um, there were not tuition fees. Um, there were still some grants for, for, for living grants um, to be an undergraduate. Uh, and um, things were just a lot less pressured and there was a lot less need to make uh, the right career decision um, when you were choosing your university degree mm. um, and the whole decision was a lot less consequential. And there was also a lot less focus generally on knowing what your career would be when you chose your degree. And I was um, mostly doing science A-levels at the time. And uh, I chose law as my degree, sort of by a process of elimination, because uh, I didn't really want to do uh, physics, which was one of my A-levels. And although I really like maths, I thought that it was getting a bit too difficult and uh, that I wouldn't be able to see it through as a degree, which I think I was probably right about. So I was looking around for something else interesting, and that's uh, really how I um, uh, chose law for my uh, degree. And uh, by coincidence, in fact, my mum and dad had been in a in a law case that had gone to the Court of Appeal, which I wouldn't say it inspired me, but it was part of the background that put law in my mind. So I applied to do law at university and I was lucky enough to to get in to do it. And that's what I did for my degree. And I think one of the things we talk about this afternoon is that um, the practice of law as a litigator, which is what I've been all my career. Um, never, I've never been uh, uh, an academic. I've never done non-contentious law. Pra practice of law as, uh, in litigation is really very different from academic law. And uh, I had a lovely time at university, but I didn't particularly enjoy uh, academic law. And um, I drifted off to do a different job in uh, in computers, and again, life was life was a lot easier for for people in their late teens and twenties. Then it was pretty easy to get a job out of university, uh, and so I found a job in uh, in computing. I did that for a couple of years, and I quite liked the computers, but I didn't really like the job. So 
I uh, decided to switch away again. And, and my friends who had gone straight from their law degrees to do law were enjoying themselves much more. And um, so I thought I would switch back to doing that. And um, I wasn't I wasn't fully committed, I have to say. I was just casting around and um, my very good friend uh, at the time who, who I'd known from university insisted that I should go and try to be a barrister. And uh, in fact, he actually went to bar school for me and got the forms and uh, <laughs> filled them in for me and made me sign them <laughs> just uh, just one day before the application date closed. So I ended up being a barrister um, that year anyway, uh, through through uh, good advice from my friends. But after that, I didn't really look back because um, being a barrister and doing lit practical litigation, I really, really enjoyed right from the beginning. Um, I was I was again quite lucky that I ended up doing the kind of law that I've done, which is intellectual property, which I ended up doing really because I had this job in computers by by mm. chance. Um, I could easily have ended up um, in, uh, in in a criminal set or a commercial set. Um, there were, uh, even family law, there are lots and lots of sets I could have gone to. Um, it was it was I don't know how many of you are thinking of going to the bar, but those of you who are will know that it's very, very tough at the moment. The numbers, the numbers are stacked against you going to the bar at the moment because it's tough to get a pupillage and it's tough uh, after you get a pupillage to get a place in chambers. But it wasn't it wasn't dead easy back then, but it was a lot easier and I was lucky enough to have a fair few offers and I ended up in intellectual property uh, because I had a you know, on paper, quite a good qualification for it because I'd done computers and I just um, uh, clicked with the, the people there uh, on a personal level. Richard, so how, how, yeah. Richard, how unusual is it, do you think, for people entering law with a science background or a sort of non-humanities background? Are you very distinctive in that respect? Do you think? So, yes, I think we are, actually. I, it, it is very, very common for me to meet a barrister in intellectual property who's got a science background. That's the, the majority of, mm. of barristers who do patents have got science backgrounds, I, I, science degrees. I mean, I, I was unusual in not having one, actually, and certainly unusual in mm. becoming a real patent specialist without a science degree. On the other hand, um, barristers who don't do intellectual property, I'd say they're very rarely scientists. Um, I think it is actually a good training for law science um, for all sorts of reasons we could discuss, but it's a good training. But I, I think the majority of barristers who didn't do law also didn't do science. Um, they do humanities. Um, I've always found in the very small sample size that I've got that the um, background that seems to produce the the best lawyers, um, no disrespect to anybody who's done anything else, but the background that produces the best lawyers I found is history actually. Um, I can think of a lot of extremely good barristers and judges who did history. There are lots of other possibilities too, but I've just noticed that connection over the years. But I'd say it's very rare that you meet a, a, a barrister outside um, IP who, who did science. An exception, um, it's a long time since he was a barrister, but a very eminent exception is uh, Lord Newberger, who became president of the Supreme Court, who um, uh, did a chemistry degree. Right. Um, so there, there, there are honourable exceptions, but quite, quite unusual, I'd say. Right. I think Denning studied math. Wasn't it? I, possibly. I'm not sure. Possibly. Not we can talk about, about whether maths, maths counts as science or not. <laughs> we can. We could. But he became a barrister. Reason, yeah. I'm not being flippant, actually, because I'd, I'd say that the processing of evidence is um, mm. crucial to science. And maths doesn't really have that in the same way, or at least pure maths. I mean, statistics, uh, you, you would say, did. But, um, yeah, I think maths is a different thing. Again, uh, yeah. I, I had a very... A very uh, clever and successful colleague who uh, who did maths and and some of them did um, pure physics, theoretical physics, which again is a bit different. 
Well, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the value of history, because certainly students who study law at Birkbeck are always encouraged to take the long view in thinking about law. And we introduced quite a lot of historical material in it. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. So yeah. once you became a barrister, you went straight into IP, obviously, with that background. Right. And yeah. you yeah. then then you moved to well, recently to become a, a, a judge. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision to leave being a barrister and you know move to the bench? And, you know, do you miss being a barrister? How, yeah, what was that uh, move so like? Let me, let, I'll take a little bit of a, of a rambling run up to that question. I, uh, I was a barrister from 1992 until 2020. Um, and um, those of your students, people on the call who, who know a bit about intellectual property will know that it's quite a broad field, actually. Um, trademarks, copyright, design right, um, passing off uh, confidential information and, and patents. And uh, different different barristers in different parts of IP specialise in different things. Um, somewhat by chance, I drifted more towards patents and I became more and more of a patent specialist. And by the time I became a judge, I did almost nothing except patents. Uh, and I did patents in um, relation to, to pharmaceuticals, uh, life sciences, which is things like antibodies, um, that sort of thing, medical devices, um, and also massively in relation to mobile phones, which is an incredibly mm. heavily patented and litigated field. And by the time uh, 2019 rolled round, which is when I applied to be a judge, I was doing very interesting cases, but one case was very much very, very similar to to the next one. So I was getting a little bit jaded with the cases I was doing. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, litigation is really tiring. Um, high court litigation, if you're a barrister, is really, really tiring. Um, very, very intense, even when you're not in court. And um, I could see that, uh, you know, I wouldn't exactly say it's a young man's game, but um, I certainly couldn't see myself doing it into my 60s and, um, uh, you know, few, few barristers in, in IP carry on fully practising into their 60s. So that was another thing. Um, I come from a family where um, most of my um, mo most of my dad's generation and his dad's generation and same on my mum's side were in um, the public sector and, and not uh, making filthy money <laughs> on their own account. So I did have quite a draw to not just uh, not just working for myself uh, for my whole career. So uh, yeah, getting a bit getting a bit jaded with what I was doing, not not foreseeing it as something I could do until the end of my working life. That was another thing. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of barristers don't believe me when I said I, I did it because I thought you should do some public service in your life. Um, barristers are very cynical like that, but that was quite a serious thing. And then the other thing was that um, the uh, the legal establishment asked me to do it. And, uh, you know, some people are just a sucker for being asked <laughs> to say yes. <laughs> and I was a little bit like that because um, in, in our system in the High Court, we have a small number of judges who are full on long term, who, who've been full on long term career patent lawyers because we have a flow mm. of really complicated patent cases that need doing. And at the time, 2019, there had been three judges, three patent judges until until then. One of them had sadly died. Another one had been promoted. Uh, and it was obvious that the third was on his way to being promoted very shortly. So there were going to be no patent judges left uh, shortly. And so um, the powers that be were, were looking for somebody to apply. Uh, the, the, the way it works um, for applying to be a judge is um, unlike the old days when the senior judges could just choose in a smoke filled room and tap you on the shoulder and tell you you got mm. it. You, you, there's a much more formal and independent process. So they couldn't tell me that I would get it, but they asked me to apply. Um, and that was another that was another reason. Um, and uh, there was also there was also a timing question about it because um, you can't just apply to be a judge, a high court judge anyway, any old time you want. You have to wait till they need a judge until there's a space to take a judge. And at the time, there were quite a few spaces in the in the section of the high court that I work in, which is called the Chancery Division. Um, but it was always possible that that would fill up. And, uh, you know, if you don't apply now, you might have to wait a few years till there's a gap. 
Um, and in fact, I got conflicting advice about that. One, one judge said to me, I think he was trying to get me to do it. He said, if you don't do it now, you might never make it. Uh, and another judge, another very senior judge said, oh, you can do it anytime you want, don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as it turns out, actually, the, the Chancery Division where I am is, is not only full, but has got um, people who've been accepted to be a judge, but haven't got a space to, to slot into. So um, the, the, there was a timing, there was a timing point with that. Mm. And then just to just to ramble on to the end of this very long answer, um, I I uh, thought it would be better for family life because you do tend to work really round the clock, at least during cases when you're a barrister. And uh, I had school aged children um, who I've always managed to see at both ends of the day, but I thought it would be better from that point of view um, and better for family life. And uh, so. Um, I made the decision with my wife. Didn't tell the kids. You're not supposed. To, you're not supposed to tell anybody, and certainly not your kids, right? Because they might go and tell someone else in the playground or something. But uh, I certainly asked my I asked my wife, and so that was a team decision. Well, we will yeah. come on to thinking about the ethics of embargoes when we look at one of the cases right, yeah. you've selected yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. about that. You mentioned something quite interesting about the importance of specialist judges. You know, that actually yeah. you, they needed a patent judge. And it reminded me that there was a lot of shock in my thought in family law when, uh, I won't mention names, but I think the previous two ago or something, there was a president of the family division was appointed and he wasn't actually a family judge. He wasn't a specialist in the family yeah. judge. And there was the yeah. arguments on the other side were saying, well, actually, judge craft doesn't require specialism because actually whatever you're doing, you're looking at evidence, you're looking at court management, you're looking at credibility. Um, and I wonder, do you think there's something specifically about patents and IP where actually you do have to be a specialist? Because it makes me think of what's happened in the legal profession, of course, is that specialism is, you know, the name of the game. And it has been for, you know, a good few decades, a couple of recent decades that move towards specialization in the profession is huge. The old idea of, you know, your GP solicitor uh, is just gone. You know, you, you, it doesn't exist anymore. So do you think specialization is as essential in in on the bench? Well, um. I uh, there's a couple of things about that. The, the, the first one is the family division is a is a much bigger um, part of the legal legal world than the patents court. I mean, there's just two two dedicated patents judges. So my my, my job has got actually quite a small amount of resource organisation. So um, you know, to be the head of a division, family division, whatever. Uh, you need to be an excellent um, leader, administrator, uh, organizer, diplomat, um, and I, I, that, I, that's not something that I'm called on to do very much. I mean, there's a bit of that, and uh, um, you know, I hope I hope I do a good job at that, but that's not the crucial thing. Um, to 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 decide a patent case, um, there's two th there's two things you need to do. Uh, one is you need to uh, get on top of the law, the patent, the patent law, and the other one is you need to understand the technology. And we have two, as I say, full time patent judges, and, and we are the only judges who can hear the most scientifically complex cases. And I think if you don't have experience in doing scientifically very complicated cases and especially the sort of science that crops up in patent cases, then it would be very, very hard to do an adequate job. Mm -hmm. So J my colleague James Miller and I do the most scientifically complex cases, and, and I think it would be, you know, it would be a, 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 a folly to give that to, to those cases to people who, who weren't used to doing scientific cases. Mm. Um, as far as as far as legal complexity goes, well, there's quite a lot of judges who can do who are allowed to do patent cases that aren't scientifically complicated because um, the law of patents is interesting and, and it's quite wide, but it doesn't change that fast and it's not impossibly difficult by any means to master um, if you are a general chancery judge. So I don't think it's the legal complexity um, that is the issue. It's it's the te technological complexity. Plus, I think I think um, if you if you if you're going to do patent cases quickly, 
you do need a lot of you do need a lot of experience under your belt. Um, there are there, but there are other bits of law where, where there are similar things. I don't know how many of your students have come across insolvency law um, or, or corporate restructuring law, but it's a little bit similar there. I don't know if any of you know about things called schemes of arrangement um, or, or, or schemes under the Companies Act, which are restructuring um, uh, arrangements that take place when a company's in, in, insolvent or near insolvent or it wants to transfer a big chunk of its business. And they are um they can be quite simple or they can be really extremely difficult both both um in the sense of the commercial instruments and contexts and in terms of the law and and, and that's also stratified a bit um i i do schemes but i do the simpler ones and the super complicated ones are, are um in practice given given to judges who very very specialized in it so mm. i think i think the short answer is Patents is one of the most specialised. It has these strange group of cases that really require you to have a lot of experience in, in, in processing very complicated science quite quickly. But it's not unique like that at all. And um, uh, other judges can do less technologically complicated patent cases than they do. And in the Court of Appeal in the in the Supreme Court, well, they're not they're not patent judges and they, they have to mm -hmm. decide. The direction well some of them are and some and some of them are not not in the supreme court especially or at least not not, not much in recent years yeah. so that so i do i do think there's a need for a proper uh, a proper little um or of very specialist judges for these for these highly specialist um parts of, of the law yeah it's interesting because there's also that other debate going on around you know complex taxation cases and can juries understand them we won't go there we'll just leave that one over there um i just wanted to pick up well, a little actually, bit just let me awful. let me let me chip in on that um, oh, please do in, in in the states you'll you'll, you'll appreciate there's a constitutional right to a jury trial at the absolute election of a party in any case that's worth more than i can't remember what the number is now but it's a very low amount five thousand dollars or something Right. So either side in a patent case in the US where the dam where there's damages at stake, which is m most of them, can choose a jury trial. Right. And yeah. um, so sometimes they end up without a jury for one reason or another. Sometimes there's no damages at stake. It's only an injunction or what, one reason or another. But normally either side can choose a jury. And because it normally is thought to favour one side or the other, you end up with a jury because it's only if both sides agree not to have one. And that's a lively discussion in America because, mm. well, a point of view is that juries just cannot understand those cases um, yeah. and that you are putting your decision making in the hands of a tribunal who just doesn't understand it. And yeah. they have to go with who they like better, uh, which is not, you know, a problematic, a problematic situation. Other, others, others say constitutional defenders of the jury system, including including some patent judges at least, say, well, um, we uh, we trust uh, jurors to have excellent common sense and to be able to sniff out who's right or wrong. Um, yeah. As somebody as somebody who has done 30 years of this and still finds myself struggling after two or three days, you know, I, I, of a case, I mean, I do get, I do get on top of it by the end of seven or eight days. But <laughs> <laughs> if I if I find myself struggling after two or three days, still working hard to understand and I think, well, how would I do this if I was a juror? I yeah. think it's a, I think it's a legitimate question to ask if it's right to put decisions in in the hands of people who don't understand them. I yeah. mean, yeah. crime crime is a bit different, I think. Um, you know, but yeah, because I think crime because, people say it's you know it's you, it's honesty that's really the the fundamental right, issue. Right, right, and right. And, um, different type of evidence. You, know, um, you you have a stronger feeling of independence from the state making the decision if it's jurors rather than mm. a judge although mm. you know mm. i mean judges are independent of the state but it doesn't necessarily give the same feeling of no being in the hands of your peers in, in a criminal case so i do think criminal cases are different but yeah. non nonetheless um i think it's a legitimate question as things get as just life gets more and more complicated to ask um what what what, what the limits of the understanding of a, of a juror is what what you can expect somebody with no um immersion in a case to to pick up in a very very short time yeah 
And, and, and very, very quickly, I'm just going to point something out to students. Yeah. So you mentioned something before about moving uh, sort of into the public sector by moving, yeah. becoming yeah. a barrister onto the bench. And um, yeah. certainly I've spoken to lots of ex Birkbeck students, alumni who have actually moved into being local authority lawyers or right. being working for the government legal service. And they've often yeah. said something quite similar, that it's a, a better work life balance. It's been they've much been enabled. They haven't been had to required to be total sort of workaholics. Um, so thinking about the government legal service, thinking about local local government um, law and um, all sorts of other avenues of being a lawyer is really important. So you know, it's a careers, careers point for people to think about. But yeah, I think uh, that's true. moving on then, I, I, I did ask you, I told you I was going to ask you an, almost an impossible question, but perhaps if you can have a couple of points about it was um, artificial intelligence. It, everybody knows it's such enormous and it's impacting on lots of things. If you could just give a sort of a quick um sense of what do you think what the biggest challenge is both in terms of running the courts actually as a court manager in effect and in terms of ip what what's the big thing coming your way because of ai at the moment well i mean i have cases about ai um that's a rather different thing but in terms of ai uh impacting on me um the answer is that it hasn't really impacted on my job very directly. Um, there are aspects of the court administration and even dealing with cases that you might expect to be uh, dealt with by AI before too long. And I'll, I'll give you an example. It's a slightly, slightly technical example. So bear with me while I explain the context. One of the kind of cases we have is um, to do with blocking websites that show pirated content. So, you know, um, Premier League is only supposed to be on a very small number of channels on Saturday afternoons and they pay a lot of money for the rights and you're not supposed to be able to see it anywhere else. But um, there are um, counterfeiters who put illegal streams up because they copy the legal stream, they put it through their website, they charge um, uh, hunters to watch it, but they don't pay any license fees. And that's a copyright infringement. And um, one of the one of the things about it is you cannot catch the actual people who are doing that, the hackers, because they're in, you know, the former Soviet wherever. Union, China, Korea, wherever that you can't you and you don't know who they are either. But what you do know is who the internet service providers are in the UK who are ultimately giving the pirated streams to the households who are, who are using a pirated stream. So the FA or UEFA or um, the boxing promoters or uh, concert promoters get orders to block the internet service providers. Um, does that make sense? So, 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 so far, so good. But in the UK, we do quite a number of these cases, but not 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 a huge number because there's only a relatively small number of rights holders who do this, UEFA, et cetera, et cetera. And there's only about four or five relevant internet service providers because virtually everybody um, in the UK, you know, 90 X percent of, of the UK is just on a few service providers. So we can do it at a quite human level. We can read each case. We can decide it. We make an order and, and so on. And probably only, I don't know, no more than a couple of dozen orders a year, maybe not that many. So that's the UK. Uh, jump over to Brazil and bear with me for a minute. In, in Brazil, they have a very similar problem, but they've got a huge number of right owners and they've got thousands of internet service providers. And on top wow. of that, in Brazil, the parties have to serve orders. The court doesn't serve a court order, the parties do. And so if you multiply hundreds of right owners by thousands of internet service providers, you get a, a, an unmanageably huge number of cases. And, and in fact, Brazil has has an enormous flow of litigation in all sorts of fields. And they just they have found that they just can't manage by uh, individual human management of individual cases. So they do use um, what you would colloquially call AI to triage and sort their cases um in ways that are creeping into the pro province of what would be the judge's province and wow. 
you, you can because they can't manage otherwise. Right? Yeah. And you can you can imagine how some simple early decisions about managing a case could quite easily be done by AI. You know, is the case worth more or less than five hundred pounds? If it's worth less, send it to the fast track. If you, do you see what I mean? Yes. We don't do that yet, but but you can see how we could. And um, you know, when there's a sufficient volume of cases and a sufficient acceptance of AI, um, maybe we'll do that. Uh, uh, we 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 don't we don't need it so intensely yet. So that's that's case management. It sounds like it's just an administrative function, but it's not really. Mm. It's a judicial function because you've got to decide: is is this case right for that court? Is it within the such and such jurisdictional limit or not? So it's starting to cross over into legal reasoning. Um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is whether judges will before long start to write their judgments with um, AI. Mm. And you might you might know that um, a judge in the Court of Appeal, a good friend of mine, uh, Colin Burse, uh, wrote a section of his judgment with with AI. Uh, and it, he, he was completely transparent about it. It, it was quite yes. well publicised and it wasn't part of the legal reasoning in the sense of the the logic leading to his conclusion. It was um, a, a, a blob of information that needed summarising, and he he knew what he knew what the information was, and he knew what he wanted the summary to say, but he just told AI to do it. So he wasn't relinquishing control because he could tell that the result that came out was what he wanted. But but he but he did that, and um, that is something. You know that that we will no doubt think about. I'm not sure it's going to become widely accepted because there are various procedural problems. Not not least that if you use a free version of um, ChatGPT, then the instructions that you gave it get sent to its servers, and so that's not that's not um, right. That, that, that the judiciary would necessarily want. Um, but you, we're 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 moving towards that uh, ever more, I think, and. Um, I, I certainly take quite a close interest on what AI is and and what it can uh, what it can do, which is amazing. If any of you haven't had a go at ChatGPT, I I encourage you to do it because it's um it is uh, very surprising, very stunning. But but um, not for writing essays. I should hasten to write those. No, not for writing essays. No, but I mean you know it, <laughs> yeah. it's interesting to know that, and uh, it's yeah. interesting to know you know there's 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 the AI. There's the algorithms that try to catch the AI, and now there's AI to avoid the algorithms for catching the AI. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you so, said you're you're involved with quite yeah. a, you've got you've got a lot of cases, Derek. Can you give a sort of a just a, um, an example of a case that you're that you've no, had to I hear? No, I haven't. I haven't. Or... I haven't got. I haven't got a lot of cases, but there are some cases. Um, there have been cases about whether AI can itself apply for a patent. There are cases oh. about whether whether AI can make an invention if if the human person who did it then applies for a patent. Um, there have been cases about um, whether copyright works can be created by AI or, or not, um, depending on the level of human in intervention. As it happens, our, our legislation kind of covered that off. Um, uh, accidentally is not quite the right word, but, but computer generated works are, are, are uh, expressly acknowledged in our legislation so it's not quite such a hot topic as it might be in the US for example that's right. an interesting case another, another interesting case and um, this is one that's been heard in court and in fact I didn't hear it so uh, I'm not I'm not saying anything that's uh, secret and of course I wouldn't tell mm. any of you anything about a case that hadn't already been public but there's a very interesting case um, making its way through the courts at the moment about using copyright works to train your AI so um, the AI that generates um, drawings, paintings, if you give it a verbal instruction, you know, paint me um, seven yellow cats, whatever, that, that's been trained on somebody else's copyright works. And whether yes, that's a copyright infringement is a very interesting question and, and a question that could get a very different answer, for example, in the US from, from that which it would get um, in the UK. So, mm. so that those that those are uh, you know um, a, a range of the topics um, that that are um, going on at the moment. There's also there's also a good number of cases, probably more cases, and probably closer to fruition 
about crypto, which isn't AI as such, but it's, you know, um, right. there's, there's, there's a lot of cases about that which involve some of them a pretty, a pretty close idea. You need a pretty good idea of how cre crypto works um, for those. Um, there is a series of cases at the moment about whether a particular gentleman called Dr. Wright um, is the man who, known as Satoshi who invented Bitcoin. And that's being litigated in, in a case that's due for hearing uh, next year. And mm. uh, he claims various rights over Bitcoin. Um, and the people he's litigating with deny, deny that he is Satoshi, which is the pseudonym of the man who invented Bitcoin. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that case. My colleague James Meller is, but it's, um, you know, it's been in court quite a bit already. That's fascinating. I'm sure we're all going to be, have to be thinking about it a lot more. I, I want to move well, sorry, on one now. Thing, one thing sorry. I would say is, no, no, if, you please, want, if you want to get into it, you need to understand what these things are and you need a little bit more than you can get out of the pages of the general press. Um, oh. So uh, I, I started off with Bitcoin for dummies, literally, and uh, I've read a bit more around the subject since then and I'm grinding my way very slowly through the main student textbook on, on AI because you know, everybody thinks AI is one undifferentiated thing and it's not, mm. it's a lot of different, mm. it works well, three or four very different things and it's really important to understand which ones, uh, which one does what and, and how it works and what its limitations are. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Oh, another, another interesting field I should mention actually is, is the law of negligence as it applies to AI because um, of the problem that with AI you don't know often how it made the decision that it did make right you, you get not you get an answer out of the algorithm but you don't know you don't know why <laughs> it's too complex and right. that is a, that's a very challenging thing when when the allegation is that it was um incompetent so. hmm. i'm definitely going to read ai for dummies over the christmas break so well, thank I'm, you for crypt, that crypt, crypto for dummies is what i reference <laughs> okay right great crypto, Crypto for dummies is actually an easier an easier call because crypto is, I would say, for, 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 I, I would say, moving somewhat slower in its technology than AI right. is. And if you if you're going to pick up a book, a general book to read, <laughs> and have a look very very carefully <laughs> at when it was written because if you're you know two years out of date is a lifetime in in, in uh, AI. Right. right. Okay. It could, if everyone could mute themselves, I might just mute everybody actually uh yeah <laughs> thanks if you could sort of unmute yourself now richard please that would be great thank okay. you great um i want to move on now to the first of the cases that you selected that we looked at and i'm just going to share my screen uh just to have a bit of an illustration of what we're looking at here um let me if you just bear with me a second where is it ah here we are yeah so we're moving from ai to a film uh, I want you to be able to see the picture. This was Florence Foster Jennings, um, a really interesting uh, film. Uh, and the, so let me just get this. Yeah. Great. And in this, uh, the, the case that you were, did, one of the questions from this course in this film was um, that you were required to adjudicate on was the credits. Uh, let me go down to it. Yeah, on the IMBD side, for every film there's an IM, IMBD page, and here you can see on this page for this film, your case concerned the writing credits. Martin and Kogan are now yeah. listed. I, I just looked that up today, so I just went to the film's website yeah. on the IMBD, and it says writing credits, Nicholas Martin, Julia Kogan, and of course the case you were looking at was Martin versus Kogan, was a dispute between them, and these words here after Julia Kogan's names, written by originally uncredited, um, is a as a result of your judgment in that case. Very quick bit of facts, I, I've asked people to read it, but just to fill in for people, um, just to give some idea about it. Uh, Nicholas Martin was a screenwriter. Um, Julia Kogan was his uh, partner. They lived together and she was an opera singer and they split up and then the film was made and her case, her argument of course, was that she was she should have a writing credit even though she didn't use the word, she'd actually was heavily involved in it. And it's quite an interesting case. It goes to a, a first case, then it goes to the Court of Appeal, then it gets back to you. 
uh, it, determining the actual copyright question. And then, of course, this case, the, the final case was about what should the credit be for that, having resolved the copyright question. And I think you determined that it was 20 percent. Is that right? In your first case, you determined that she should be acknowledged for 20 percent. And then you decide these are the appropriate words, because it seemed to you there were lots of different ways of expressing it. Is it written by or screenplay by or story by and all the different uh, uh, professional guidance documents us were some help in that case. Um, it's an unusual case. I mean, uh, crediting in films is often a matter of con co contract. Uh, you know, size of your billing, how are you going to be referred to? They're often people's contractual terms. So uh, even though the copyright claim was, was separate there, I wonder if you can say a little bit about why it's so unusual. What was it like being faced with deciding a case that was actually about the wording of the credit on a particular website? Because I've never come across a case like that before. Yeah, so um, you, you summarised it quite well, what the, what the background was. Um, I, I mentioned this as something to discuss today for a few reasons, really. Um, one is it's quite a good illustration of how um, litigation is really different from academic law, because um, in that case, uh, as you say, um, they'd, they'd had the trial once and the judge who heard that trial had got the law wrong and he had found in favour of Nicholas Martin and the case went to the Court of Appeal and uh, Julia Cogan got the decision um, set aside. But the way that the Court of Appeal decided it was that the judge the first time round just hadn't hadn't made a decision about some of the very important facts. So the case was sent back to be tried again, which is very rare. That's that's regarded as a bit of a catastrophe mm. in English law. Um, you know, if, if if the Court of Appeal disagrees with you on the law, they should still have the facts to decide what the right answer is. So um, in, in that case, I was just doing a pure fact finding exercise because the Court of Appeal had said exactly what the law was. Mm. But um, for, for as, a, as a sort of career, a bit of career guidance for anybody who's considering a career in the law, um, it's really worth understanding. And this case kind of illustrates an extreme case that what you're nearly always arguing about is the facts. And mm. finding facts, arguing facts, uh, evidence and procedure are, are bread and butter for um, uh, judges and litigators. And we quite it's quite rare for us to actually dis need to decide something new about the law, whereas that's what you argue about and think about all the time when you're when you're a law student. So that's that's the first thing mm. that's pertinent about it. The, the second thing about it is that it was a very human story um, mm. when it came to the fact finding, and this is all set out in the judgment because um, the, the the as I said in the judgment, the two the two protagonists' views were all really to do with their desires for their career and their feeling about their career in the past and the future. Because Nicholas Cogan, who who I found had written most of the film script had been quite successful before he'd, he'd had quite a lot of tv credits and so on his his partner romantic partner julia cogan um had um not been successful before although she, as, as a screenwriter although she'd been successful as an opera singer so they both had tremendously different desires and perspectives um about what they had done what they wanted for the future um and that's why it was a very interesting, quite challenging mm. fact finding exercise. And it was also an interesting one because there was a lot of contemporaneous documents, emails and WhatsApp chats between them and so on and so forth. And it was a very interesting exercise in what's very topical in the law at the moment, which is about deciding what's more important between people's recollection, their subjective recollection mm. and what you can see from the, from the documents. I, I, I was going to ask you about Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that point because it comes up in what I think the early judgment where Halcon says, um, I placed little weight on recollection. Yes. It sort of dismisses it. And it sort of rather reminded me of the very difficult equity cases in sort of family law around who owns the home and there's no agreement. It's yeah. just, well, we lived together, we did this, I thought you meant that, yeah. you thought we meant that. And there's really nothing on paper. You know, there's really yeah. hard to find yeah. anything yeah. there. And yeah. all you've got is recollection. I wondered if right. you could sort of distinguish this sort of as you've described it, fact-finding exercise uh, uh, and cases where recollection is all you've got. 
Or w- would you agree with Halcombe that he's right that, you know, placing weight on recollection is, is to be avoided? Well, I mean, uh, actually, I mean, that was one of the reasons he was overturned, because the Court of right. Appeal said, yes, yes, documents are very important, but you're not allowed to just say that you're going to mm. cross out the recollection evidence owing to the fact that there is some documents. They said they, the Court of Appeal said he'd gone too far in that respect. And there's very, very interesting scientific work going on at the moment, uh, which, which, which is, you know, thought, thought about quite carefully by the judges um, about this sort of thing, because what the pendulum, like lots of things in, in law, the pendulum has swung on this between recollection documents, recollection documents. And, and one of the things that people are becoming starting to become a bit more aware of at the moment is that the creation of documents is not just a neutral act of recording black and white history because people write down what they think happened. And the subjective desire to think that something happened is is, is as important then for different reasons as it is when you try and recall it later on. So you mustn't, so, so the lesson of that case is you mustn't overdo documents. They are super important, mm. especially if they've been created by somebody other than the people who whose recollection you're testing. But you can't just say, well, I'm going to scrap recollection, it, partly because, as you say, there must be some cases where that's all you've got. And and secondly, because it is it is still evidence. So that was, yeah. that was an interesting part of the case. Another interesting facet of the case was that they were litigating over, um, ultimately, as it turned out, well, they're still they're still arguing about how much the case was worth. So I won't I won't comment in detail on that. But it wasn't the sort of case where the case was going to cost half a million pounds, but that's OK, because there's a hundred million pounds at issue. The, mm. the amounts the amounts at issue, at least on, on one of their views of it, was probably less than the cost of the case. And and that's something that I is common to the law, but not something I've had to deal with. Um, and especially that that obviously was amplified by the fact that they had to have two trials. And and what was crucially um, at issue and that you touched on earlier, Danny, was was the writing credit on IMDb. Yeah. Because for the future, Julia Cogan thought and uh, I uh, kind of agreed with her, which is why I, why I reached the decision I did, that that what she really wanted was the validation of having been a genuine creative member of the team that had written um, a successful, critically successful um, major, major movie, because of course people who would like to be screenwriters can go for decades and never get, never get a credit on a major picture. So, um, Julia Cogan certainly regarded it as 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 not the, not the only thing, but a crucial part of of uh, of what she was looking for, which was recognition. And she um, she may I don't know. It's up to her <laughs> to say. I suppose. I mean, she may feel she got that from the judgment, and right. certainly certainly the decision uh, which led to the, the the credit on IMDb was something she she said was important to her. Yeah. So that was that was a slightly uh, very unusual facet of the case i mean i was i was um breaking new ground there i mean i don't know of any other case where anybody's decided what should go on imdb i mean that's ultimately up to imdb <laughs> no and i showed just yeah. a moment under the uh, if you go to the imdb but website and you go to the trivia button if you scroll yeah. down there's actually a reference to the case on the trivia button so i don't know whether yeah. you're yeah. unique in having your judgment referred to in a trivia um, site on the IMVD website. Um, one thing that struck me interesting about the case was that I, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, that she, that she wasn't saying she wrote the actual words, but that it was it was almost the conversation she had. And clearly he was living with an opera singer and, you know, it's a film about an opera singer, even though I'm sure she's a better singer than the singer in the film. But yeah. it was actually, that must be really hard to say, well, what was her involvement there in terms of discussions, in terms of inspiration? And how can you trace the role of inspiration to what actually ends up in a script? Yes, Is that so, something that you so, were grappling with? Uh, the judgment covers that in, in quite a lot of detail. I mean, she wasn't create, she wasn't contributing the words or, or only I think mm. I, I may be wrong. But from recollection, uh, there was very few words she created. Um, but you can it, the law is fairly clear. So I didn't really have to decide any law. The law, the law is fairly clear that if you craft a character, or, um, or a plot line, um, then those are things that that 
can attract copyright protection and that's the sort of thing she had done um the dialogue i think i found came 100 percent from him um and a lot of the plot in a sense was factual because france foster yes. is a re real a person so yes. neither of them could get the credit for that um mm. but uh the um i think I, as i recall i found that she created a lot of the um emotional dynamic between some of the key characters which is um uh meryl streep who played the opera singer herself and her husband um who was played by um hugh grant um and a couple of other characters so so um it's hard to put into words exactly how you describe that i did my best but but it wasn't it wasn't really a, a an analytical difficulty that she hadn't mm. written the words because the law is pretty clear that you don't have to do that to be uh the creator of of that sort of um of that sort of dramatic work yeah, yeah. It, it struck me that there's a quite sort of a feminist dimension to it and that there are there's you know history's littered with stories where uh the the husband the man gets lots of credit and actually the, you know the role of the wife who's living with him listening to him talking to him giving advice doesn't get the credit at all there's yes. quite a lot of yes. evidence there well that. i mean i i said something about the um gender dynamic between them in the in the judgment because um uh you know he was he was somebody who had been successful as a screenwriter um and had that uh, what would you call it social capital and um she wanted to do that but she had not yet been successful so mm -hmm. there was a you know that that imbalance um was uh, an important part of the factual fa findings i made and similarly um another another party who we haven't really discussed very much was the production company and yes. um because he was uh an established player in um mostly tv production he he had relationships there that she didn't and so um some i'm not uh, the, the judgment records what who was right or wrong about this but one of her perceptions which i think i said was understandable was that um she couldn't afford to challenge him at the time directly and say no no you didn't write this i did write, i wrote it because it would lead to an estrangement with the production company so mm -hmm. it uh i can't i i you know my I, my judgment speaks for itself i'm not trying to change it or anything but um one had to be sensitive to the fact that she wasn't she she claimed she didn't feel able to give a completely straightforward account of it at the time because she was concerned that she would just fall out with the production company and the movie would never be made because they had a mutual interest at the time obviously yes in of course. getting the film made there was no point there was yes. no point falling out about who'd written it if the consequence was going to be that the movie didn't get made <laughs> yeah so yeah. you know it was a complicated complicated setup uh, yeah. like that yeah thank you we're going to move to the second case that you um, proposed to discuss. And again, I'm just going to yeah. share my screen here because in a blog about this case, someone's made a cartoon picture of you, which I'm sure you're you're, you're familiar and you've seen. Yeah, my kids um, love this. Yeah. yeah, your children like this one, do they? Right, right. Yeah, um, quite unusual to see you, you know, in 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 the ring there, and. Um, you accused my clerk get time to get slammed. A judge has lambasted a solicitor for appearing to blame a court clerk for leaking a judgment when there had been no leak. Um, I, I read that, Kate, with some interest. I mean, it, at its heart, of course, it's about the procedures around draft judgments. And I hadn't ever actually thought about the law relating to uh, draft judgments and the procedures. One of those classic issues that I think legal academics never really think about but is actually in terms of practice really important you know legally you know when you're studying law at university you read the substantive law but actually all the rules and procedures around the what you do with a draft judgment when the parties have been informed about is something that you'd never really discuss it as a university degree at all so that's you know it's really great to read a case like that because i do know and as your case makes very very clear in and the the rules practice direction 40e makes clear um they they serve quite an important purpose in practice a draft judgment before it's actually um uh, held down um so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about this case and why i mean i've got some questions about it but what, what was the what, what did you think i mean your your own judgment is quite clear about your views about bad practice there and I, there's one thing i'm you know i'll get my question in quickly i'm sort of, the remedy if that's for want of a better word in this case was um 
almost a kind of a naming and shaming in your judgment. There's a part of it, I think you're saying, I'm really going to name and shame you in this judgment, and that should be penalty enough. I don't need to go any further, and it was taken far too much time anyway. But over to you, could you could talk us through this case a little bit? This yeah, is so, the... so, so, so your point is, um, you, your point's very well made one, Danny, that this is, this is the sort of thing that uh, is really important in litigation practice, but but won't be something that will really ever um, get on the radar of uh, of somebody studying law academically. So so what happens is, in in cases of any complexity, uh, where you don't just speak out your judgment at the end of the hearing. So pretty much any any case in the high court, any trial in the high court, you write down your judgment and give it to the parties in writing. Well, that's 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 okay, that's fine, but. Um, we have a practice where we give it to them in draft several days, sometimes sometimes a couple of weeks even, before it becomes public. And there's two, two reasons for that. One is that they're supposed to tell you if you've um, made typos or any really obvious errors that should be fixed before you put the judgment in the final form. And the other one is to enable the parties to get ready to deal with the consequences of the judgment. So. Sometimes the parties know that their share price will go up or go down or they'll need, you know, their reputation will be damaged. They need to get their press releases ready and so on and so forth. And that's all regarded as legitimate. The difficulty is that um, there is therefore a period where they've got some information that the public haven't got. And especially if the information could affect their share price, that's very, very touchy. This case, in fact, wasn't about um, share price, but the, the point of law that I was deciding was you know, was going to be significant for other cases and it would benefit other people um, in the industry, which was the mobile phone industry, if they knew what I decided. It didn't, didn't, in fact, didn't even matter whether I was right or wrong, just knowing what I thought the answer was. So it is a very serious thing to leak a, a, a draft judgment and it's a contempt of court. And um, there have been all too many cases where that has happened. And the rather unique thing about this this one was that um, I was after I'd given my draft judgment, I got a letter from one of the parties saying, "We're well, sorry to say, but it seems there's been a leak." And um, I said, "Well, that's not good, but you better find out how it happened." So they went off to find out how it happened because it could have just been a mistake, you know, or somebody sent it to the wrong email or whatever. And a few days later. Um, they wrote back and said, well, our clients told us that the that the leak came from you, Judge, <laughs> or your office. Um, and that's a totally different thing, you know, to say, well, Judge, sorry, we and the solicitors firm who had the draft judgment sent it to the wrong email, well, state very sorry. That's one thing to say, oh, well, Judge, it came from you or your clerk um, really took it's things to a whole new, yeah. whole new level. It's I mean, an extraordinary allegation. Yeah, but to cut to, to cut to the end of the story, it turned out that it hadn't been leaked at all. Um, no. They they made a mistake when they thought it yes. had been leaked, or at least that was that was what they said, and I ultimately accepted that. Um, so so that was all um, quite unusual. I mean, the reason um, that I put this one forward for discussion is partly because the situation's interesting. But partly also because, as you say, Danny, in that in that rather odd thing from Road on Friday, uh, I'm in the ring with with, with my wig on. But the, the interesting thing, I think, is when you become a judge, one of the great things about it is that you stop being one of the combatants. And mm. that's one of the reasons why, in general, being a judge is a bit less stress because you're not you're not in a position where you're going to win or lose. But every now and then you get sucked back into being. Um, a, a competent <laughs> uh, yeah. in 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 the uh, in the sites, and and that's how that one felt. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a lovely and, quote. There's a lovely quote yeah. from you in the case where you say, yeah. uh, you know, uh, "I have only been a judge a short time, but I'm not naive yeah. enough to think that parties do not say very disobliging things about judges yes. when they yeah. are unhappy with the way a hearing has gone or yes. disappointed in result." However, yes. this was a party who saw itself as winning, making yeah. an assertion, not yeah. about me, or at yeah. least not just about me. Yeah, yeah. It could be about your friends, an entirely yeah. innocent party. Um, yeah. Well, that was the other thing that was particularly that was gorgeous, particularly unpleasant about it was that, in fact, they, mm. uh, they, 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 um, they showed me all the WhatsApps that they'd sent around to each other at the time. And the one in question said, uh, Mead's office leaks like a sieve. 
Um, yeah. And well, I haven't got an office. I mean, I've got a clerk, a very, a very um, helpful, wonderful woman who, who, who is my clerk. I haven't got an office. It made it sound like I had twenty people. I know. Me. But yeah. to anybody in the profession, that uh, I, that 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 pointed the finger at just that one individual who is my clerk. Um, and you know, I'm sure every time I find against somebody, there's a WhatsApp somewhere that says Mead's an idiot. You know, he's messed it up again. Oh, well, I, I'll take that on the chin. But when it says, you know, mm. Mead's Mead's clerk is a crook, that's a yeah. totally different thing. And the other reason I think it's worth mentioning is because it, um, you know, it it hit home at a a relationship that I had with other people uh, as a judge, mm. which normally is, you know, completely. Uh, you're completely insulated from. So it's just an interesting case, I think, about um, getting sucked back into the battle yourself. Because when you're a barrister, you quite often face personal criticism from your client, the judge, the other side. Somebody says you've done this wrong or you've been untruthful about this. That, that, that's, you know, part of the, mm. part of the setup. And, um, yeah. you know, uh, it, you, you, you take that on the chin. But I thought I'd left that behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And no, but uh, you. you at all. Yeah. There was yeah. something about the the words you used in your judgment leave no doubt at all in anyone's mind about your displeasure. I mean, there, I think at one point the other side, or no, not the other side, but some of the people involved in the case were saying, "Well, it was just locker room chat among guys discussing the football game," and you described yeah, that as yeah. distasteful and extraordinary. Um, well, it wasn't at all. I mean, it, it wasn't. Mm. It wasn't. Oh, Mead's an idiot. We've lost, or you know, no. let them mm. the breaks. It was. It was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, yeah. t- time's rolled on. It does. It doesn't. Yes. It doesn't feel so raw now. In fact, I bought. I bought my clerk a sieve for Christmas that year, actually, because <laughs> 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 she's a very keen baker. <laughs> I one right. of those that you do ice I, with. Yeah, yeah. I did want, I mean, having never thought about the law and uh, the regulate rules and procedures around draft judgments, I, I yeah. did dig a bit. And it struck me that in some, I think in some jurisdictions, you know, another comparative perspective, they, I think some German courts, I think, they actually have the process where results, the actual decision is released immediately. And they say, well, you know, we'll give you the judgment later, yeah. but we're just going to tell you what the result is. And then yeah. that's out in the open. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, you, you can do it. Um, I've done it in small cases. The, the trouble is, you've got to be absolutely sure you know what the result is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, personally, personally, I would say that 19 times out of 20, I do know what the result is at the end of a trial. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I think it would be a catastrophe if you announced that the claimant had won reasons to follow and then you went away and started thinking about your reasons and decided that you that they hadn't. Yes, because I so, certainly, you know, as an, an academic writing, you know, yeah. you, you, your arguments develop in the actual writing. You they know, do. When, you, yeah. when you put it yeah. down on yeah. paper, something yeah. that looks, yeah. looks perfectly yeah. sensible in so, your head. So, so small procedural things where, where I'm absolutely certain and just the timing is, you know, that you're giving your decision at half past four and you haven't got time to give your reasons. You give them the next morning, but the parties need to know the answer because it's got immediate consequences. That's that's that happens fairly often. Yeah. But um, I think I think it would be judges are far too cautious, I think, in this country to do that. There, yeah. there's, there's another place where I practice a lot called the European Patent Office, where they absolutely do do that every time. They always announce the result on the day. Um, wow. but, uh, I guess they, 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 if, if you know that that's how you can do it, then I guess you, you, you probably, you probably adapt to that. Right. There was another thing that interested me in this, and again, as I say, having never thought about this at all, was this, uh, there are clear rules about non-disclosure and, you know, there's an embargo, uh, um, uh, with these draft judgments, but the, the, it's not just sort of sending the judgment to somebody by email. There's these reference to the result being communicated by mood. So if you're the lawyers and the barristers on a case yeah. and the party yeah. and you know, you know, you've just won a great victory, a great yeah. case. Yeah. People are going to pick up on the fact that yeah, you're just in a slightly yeah, yeah. buoyant yeah, yeah. mood. And no, that, no. that's really well, tricky, that. How, yeah, how do people well, not communicate the results somehow? Well, you just have to be careful. But, I mean, it's true, yeah. especially especially in... I, I think this isn't a comment on the integrity of the bar at all. It's just, it's just the physical way things are arranged. In a solicitor's firm, 
if everybody's in a happy mood, well, it's still within the firm of solicitors who act only for one side. Right. But in, in a barrister's chambers, there'll be people sometimes who are on both sides of the case, or there'll be barristers who are in the case and other barristers who are completely uninvolved but know it's going on. Yes. So certainly I knew I knew sometimes who'd won or lost a case. And, and uh, w when things were a bit more informal, people would break the embargo you know, in as you said earlier, locker room chat. And they never, they never should have done that, and I don't think that happens anymore. Mm. But um, it is, it is an insoluble problem that people can tell from the mood. Uh, there's, 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 there's not an answer to that. You just have to be, you just have to be careful no. about it. Yeah. And I, I suppose the thing associated with that is, of course, that the, the, there can be quite a big time lag um, between the end of a case and the written judgment being produced. I mean, I think somewhere yeah. in the case it refers to, you know, be, be, between three weeks or eight months. And I think we were you know, all aware of cases where, you know, the courts, the court hearings over and then you can wait months and months and months and months before you get the judgment, yeah. a really yeah. long time. I mean, yeah. how do you as a judge, this is back to your role of, you know, day to day role judge, a, a job of being a judge. You've got to hear cases, you've got to manage the court, you've got to find time to sit and write your judgments. Yeah. And there's no sense of there being a deadline for that do you impose the deadlines on yourself for uh how long you give yourself to write a judgment or how do you manage that so there is a deadline actually there is a deadline is that? Sorry, you're never, right. you're, you're not a not a completely inflexible one but you're not supposed to ever let a judgment be outstanding for more than three months and if a judgment is outstanding for more than three months you are supposed to tell your um uh boss not quite that's not quite the right word in the judicial word world but your boss that that's happened and sometimes it happens for very understandable reasons like you went straight from one case into another one or you did a case that lasted a year and you're obviously going to take mm. more than three months but that that is a rule um i've never gone over the three months but i've never had a case that's so big that i can't i i I hate having judgments over my head and I find them massively more difficult to do when my memory's not fresh. So in a rather um, neurotic way, I make sure I've just booked time to write the judgment after it's finished. I, I have had times when I have done two on the balance. In fact, in fact, when I did Martin and Kogan, I was a very new judge and I did two trials back to back. Um, and so I did trial A then trial B and in fact I said to myself well I don't remember trial A anyway already so I did trial A trial B which in fact was Martin and Kogan and then I wrote right. the Martin and Kogan judgment and then I went back to the other one uh, I said I didn't break the three months but I but the second one I was writing when my recollection wasn't wasn't as fresh so right yeah. And, I, and I'd like to ask you a sort of general questions about writing, because, you know, you write judgments and it's something we discuss, well, you know, discuss with students. We sort of read lots of ju judges. We read lots of case law. We read lots of yeah. judgments. Yeah. And often we comment on rhetorical styles, uh, different approaches. Some yeah. judges like very, very long judgments. You know, as a family lawyer, um, uh, Sir James Mumby is notorious for his judgments going on for pages and pages and pages. And yeah. You, you know, you'll be familiar with those wonderful sort of Victorian judgments that are sort of yeah. a page and a half or two pages. Yeah. Yeah. What's your view on your both? OK, two questions there. Um, do you try and be as succinct as possible in your judgment? And what would you say? And it's probably very hard for you to answer this, but what would you say was your style of writing? Well, I um, aim for a uh, functional and even boring style. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I don't deliberately write something and then edit it to make it more boring. But I think your job is to get a. I think, I think, but I personally, I think when you're a first instance judge, which I am, and your main job is finding the facts and the law, if you have to, but the main job is finding the facts and then applying law, which is normally quite well known, then the most, Im I, I think it's important to be very systematic. So I make sure that I leave court with a list of the things I have to decide and I make sure the parties have, have agreed that. And then I write a judgment and I literally tick off the list that I've covered everything. And in patent cases, there's a not inflexible, but a fairly, a fairly obvious sequence and structure of how to do that. And I follow that. So it's not the most interesting thing. Um, and it doesn't, it, it's not beautiful, 
but I think it does the job. And so I regard myself as more of a kind of on-call plumber than a poet who writes sonnets. <laughs> right. Uh, and, so and... <laughs> I do. I do allow myself the occasional joke, but and I, and you know, or and I and I deliberately sometimes inject some emotion into it, like I did in the Optus and Apple one. Absolutely. Um, but um, I um, think that being being a first instance judge, especially is a practical job and you have to make sure you cover the bases and that does lead to long judgments actually and, and the other yeah. thing i would say that requires confidence and experience is to know when it when you've reached a point that you're so certain in your own mind about such and such a point that you won't even bother to decide this other point because it just right. doesn't matter and that, simi that, yeah. similarly i sometimes say in my judgments I've decided the case a, a loses because of this. Here are the other points, and I'm not going to worry about the law, but I will find all the facts because if my main reason gets overturned in the court of appeal, then the court of appeal have got the facts, which only the only the trial judge, only I can do, and they can apply the law. And that's to avoid the Martin and Cogan problem, actually, which is if you you will get overturned sometimes, but if you do, the court of appeal must be able to. But another result in place, and that means you've got to find the facts. So, uh, so it requires confidence and experience to say I'm not going to decide this, mm. but I will find the facts. And so I do that. I do that a fair bit. I mean, that that uh, as great you just mentioned that because just what I was about to ask was what's it like being overruled by the Court of Appeal? Have, how well, often have you been overruled by the Court of Appeal? Once. Only once, right? Right. Only right. I kept my I kept my virginity intact for three and a half right. years, three years. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, uh, well, I I knew that I wouldn't take to it well, and I and sure enough, I didn't. Um, there have been some cases where I've said to myself, there have been lots of cases where I've just known what the law is, and I've just got to find the facts and apply the law. There's the result, and if you do a thorough job, you shouldn't get overturned. And that's mostly been my experience. There have been other cases where I'm, especially in these mobile phone cases, for boring reasons I won't go into, where I'm just breaking, making fresh tracks in the snow. And you could go either way. Either answer is reasonable, and it's not even really my job to decide it. The Court of Appeal will decide that. And if they if they say, well, um, you know, you, 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 in this new area, the law is actually not what you thought it's the other one. Well, I, I that hasn't happened to me yet, but if it did, I think I'd think just, well, that's fine. I did my job and I'm not the one who makes new law and you do, so that's fine. The one time I got overturned, they said that I'd got, in fact, it was 2-1 in the Court of Appeal. <laughs> mm. So, so you know, it's a two, as far as I'm concerned, it's a 2-2 two -two draw, but right. <laughs> that's, not the way, that's not the way it goes down no. in, in, in the history books. Um, they they said that I had muddled up two things, which I don't think I had muddled up at all. So I was a bit cross because I thought I thought they were I thought I still think I was right and they were wrong. But that happens, and no doubt I'll get used to it um, a bit more as 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 time goes by. Yeah, right. And maybe that dissenting judgment on the Court of Appeal will at some point, you know, they'll be able to vindicate it subsequently. Well, um, yes, we'll see. between between I I if you toss up the years of patent experience possessed by the two who agreed with me, I me and the other guy. And the two uh, went the other way. Yeah, you can get yeah. the exercise if you want to. <laughs> I suppose, and I suppose some been pointing out that, of course, that's part of the system, you know, and of course, there's law students, you know, it would be very boring if judges didn't get overruled. So you sort of do us a favour in a way because then it becomes yeah, more that's interesting. True. That's true. I mean, one thing I was going to say, actually, is, and I think this is, this is, I think, a really important thing if you transition from an academic career to a career in litigation. When you are studying law at university, there's a kind of unwritten premise that all the judgments you're reading are good judgments where you can kind of scrutinise in an intellectually valid way whether they're right or wrong. And, you know, one one gets essays written, this, case, this judge said that and this judge said the other and these are the inconsistencies and this, that and the other. Any litigator knows that some judgments are just rubbish. And any litigator knows that some judges, not current judges, let's say, but you know, yeah. some judges in history were useless. And there is no point writing an essay about a judgment from a judge who everybody knew was useless, even if it's interesting. And so you have to scrutinise not only 
the intellectual contents of well you're just asking yourself a very different question you know there, mm. are, there are quite a few judgments in any field of law where if you say to a practitioner you know as i used to because i was a patent lawyer but every now and then we'd need a company lawyer or a bankruptcy lawyer to come and tell us something and i would read the cases that they gave me that we we're going to use and i'd say that surely this case says that and they'd say, well, I know you think it says that, but all us bankruptcy lawyers know that that judge was a notorious drunk and he just was rubbish. So we just don't, you know, <laughs> we pay no attention to his judgments. So, right, right. <laughs> you, you know, ju judgments are building blocks, but they're not of the same quality and they're not regarded as being of the same quality mm. by the profession. And, you know, there are some there are some bits of law. I'm sure you've studied them where. What's going on is that different judges over time just have different small p political views about things and mm. the law just changes depending on what the um, leaning is of the most senior judge at the time so I don't know if any of you are contract mm. lawyers but how many cases have we had about the interpretation of contracts too many I mean and I don't just mean in, in at first instance I mean from the Supreme Court over 50 or 60 years and you know, it swings back and forth between literalists and contextualists and uh, the same with the law of intention in murder, which is one of the mm, things you mm, study mm. early on in in, in uh, crime uh, in, in an undergraduate degree. It's, co it's come and gone. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I feel talking about the same thing again and again. And, you know, I kind of think that the, that the most senior judges would be would be better off say, saying to themselves, we're going to decide it once and for all. There'll be certainty and the next guy down the line might not like it, but let's just leave it. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose they think, that, you know, certainty won't give them the result they actually think is fair in the case in front of them and then they play with it. I'm really conscious of time yeah. no, um, sure. and I just want to quickly open it up to see if there's any couple of questions. Of, we've got time for just a few questions from students on the call. So if anyone would like to write in the chat or put their hand up, uh, who'd like to ask the first question? Yes. There's a hand up there. Uh, Gadak, what would you like to ask? Um, hi, um, I'm a first year student and the reason why I decided to do law is because I wanted to become a judge. But I'm really confused as to the pathway of becoming a judge. Like what qualifications do I need? How long does it take? If you could just give me some guidance on that, I'd appreciate okay. it. G Gadak, I'm not going to ask that one now because I can give you all that, you know, but we will cover that on the careers course and on Judicial Appointments Commission and all of that. So it's a really great question. And I'll, if you contact me, Gadak, I'll give you the answer. You know, I, I can fill you in on that. There's something we're actually we're going to be teaching in a few weeks time to first year students when we think about appointment of judges. So that's something that's going to crop up in your seminar in about two weeks time. All right. That's an exact thing we're going to be looking at in the seminars for first year students in two weeks. Great question that how that's changed the introduction of the Judicial Appointments Commission, as um, Mr. Justice Mead was saying, the move from the tap on the shoulder. Yeah, we'll look at that in a moment. Great question. Baston. Yes, Baston, what would you like to ask? Hi, Professor. I've dropped my question in the in the chat. OK, so your question is, it would be interesting to hear uh, Mijay's opinion on whether the UK might return to its traditional approach to originality in the context of copyright now that we are no longer part of the EU. Right. Wow. That's okay. An excellent question. The, the, the short answer is, will we return to our traditional approach? No, incredibly unlikely. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting question because um, we, when we, when we, post Brexit, there's a large amount of law we have which came from the EU, and uh, the question about originality in the context of copyright came both from some EU legislation, but also from EU case law, and in particular a case called InfoPAC. And um, we used to have an approach to originality in copyright that, if you did anything at all, even the most boring little drawing, um, most functional little drawing. It enjoyed copyright and the EU came up with a with a test which we apply from this InfoPAC case called and I'm summarizing enormously um, the artist's own intellectual creation, which was a, required more creation, more intellectual input. Um, and the Court of Appeal has looked at some related fields um, and said that we will continue to follow the um, ACI, as they call it, the case law. The accumulated case law of the of the Court of Justice in very 
um, closely related fields. So we will we will stick with that short of short of the UK legislating to change it, which I I can't see what that, that's a different question whether the government might want to legislate, but there's no obvious reason that they would. So I, I don't think that'll change. There's a, the, the case you want to read is a case called Tune In, Tune In against Warner, um, Lord, Lord Justice Arnold, which goes through some very important bits of Euro law in this sort of area and, and discusses whether we'll stick with it or not. OK, thank you. And there's a question in the chat. I'll, I'll ask this one, Ian, because of the time. Um, do you say uh, licensed authorised uh, barristers to conduct litigation moving into IP patent cases in the future? I think this is about the um, someone's worked as a paralegal helping barristers working on public access instructions in complex yeah. problems. So, 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 so you, can, you can do direct access for patent litigation. There's nothing that excludes it. Um, it's the size of the cases that really militates against that. I think I'm not sure if that answers the answers the question, um, but uh, it, it's tended just not to happen. Um, there's a bit of it, but but not that much. OK, any other questions? I've got the final question I'm going to ask, which we always ask uh, our guests in these legal practice conversation. We've got just time for one more question. Any IP IP students out there want to Jack ask a quick question? there, I could see. Mangle, yes. hand up there. Yeah, it's the question in the chat we've just looked at. Oh, okay. That, that, oh, is that, it? that right. long. Okay. 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 Cool. Well, I will ask the last question then. Uh, this is something we always ask. It's a bit sort of like our desert island, uh, desert island discs question for guests on these legal practice conversation series. Is that and we 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 give our guests absolute legislative power. Oh, very quickly, quick question from Danny, and then we'll come to my question. Danny. Danny Danker. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, it's actually funny enough. It's leading on from your question, uh, your your input, Danny, uh, regarding how do judges um, judge inspiration. So in, in my head, I, I translate into how do you judge on it? Is there are there rules or a test for an intangible? Okay. Intang I didn't hear that. That was a bit that was a bit distorted at mine. I didn't hear the question very well. Yeah. Yeah. It's Can not like repeat? it's. Um, um, let me take. Can you hear me? Yes, one, two. Just about. Right. Um, it's regarding Daniel's comment on inspiration with the the writer, um, as in the input from the wife. And, oh yeah. Um, so my question is, how do you judge, or is there a test for an intangible, uh, such as you know, do, do you know what I mean? Or yes, yes, yes. So, so it's a, it's a constant it's a constant thing in 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 copyright. The idea between the difference between an, just an idea and its expression and that's what, what we try to capture so you couldn't have copyright in the in the just the simple the pure idea of let's do a film about an opera singer it's too general it's too intangible it's just an idea but when you move towards something more more concrete like she's an opera singer she thinks she's great but she's actually really terrible and she's got a relationship with her husband who loves her so much that he doesn't want to tell her that she's terrible and uh, you can see it slides down a spectrum so it's easy to say what, what the test is or it's not too difficult but deciding which side of the line it is is the tricky bit and that's what that's what judges try to do then if that answers your question yeah as i tell my students you know so judging, like a lot of law is a line drawing exercise it so is. Yeah. final uh, couple of minutes just got time for this last question which as i said is our sort of desert island disc question for all our guests um you have absolute legislative power and you're allowed to introduce a law something to ban something to allow something uh, what law would you like to introduce or well, an aspect of change in the legal system you have total would, power to do something now i would um reinstate uh, a lot i don't know how much but a lot of civil legal aid um, because mm. I think uh, there are too many litigants. This isn't a political opinion. I mean, it's just it's just an observation about the, uh, you know, the, the judgment about whether we've got the money to do that is for the politicians. But from mm. from the from the process side of the of the coin, from the judges observation side of the coin, there uh, a lot of stress is suffered by people having to do litigation on their own. Um, and uh, we're helped actually a lot by people who do pro bono cases. Um, but uh, it would be nice, I think, if the money was around and if priorities allowed it to um, reinstate a lot of uh, a lot of civil legal aid. I, I, 
you, I've, I've, I've covered my backside three or four times there. I stress that is not a that is not a political opinion. Deciding whether the money goes to the health service or legal aid or whatever, that's for the politicians. But it yeah. would it would make my job job a lot easier, and I think a lot of litigants would suffer a lot less stress if they could get some public help with uh, the presentation and of their cases. Yeah, I've heard uh, many judges say the same. Just in terms yeah. of you know, uh, it would actually speed things up. Some of them have said actually and it save would. money in some ways. It actually, would. yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that. And uh, my like every, everybody here to join me in thanking. Uh, Richard for coming to join in this evening. Yeah. It's been really interesting. There are many things we could carry on talking about, um, but we I, so we are going to finish promptly at seven thirty. Yeah. Well, it's been so, very good to see everybody. And um, uh, if I, if any of you are at any uh, seminar or conference I'm ever at, do do come and say hello. You'll have to tell me that you were on this call because I'm not remember your names or your faces, obviously. But uh, it'd be very nice to meet any of you uh, in person sometime. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. My pleasure. That's Thank great. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. -bye.